Um, the chapter that I started on in your book, believe it or not, was actually chapter nine, and it's titled "Why Not Me." Oh, yeah. And that that chapter, the, I, the book fell open to that chapter, and it caught my eye, and I immediately just began to read it, and then I realized halfway through it, I got to start this book at the beginning. And I want to talk about that <laughs> "why not me" concept because I think everyone asks the question, "Why me? Why? Why, why? me?" Sure. And you do it's such a very a... human question, isn't it? Yes, it is. You do a beautiful job of breaking that down. Well, I don't want to shame people for asking "why me" because I did it, and all of us do. I mean, there's a kind of natural human inclination to want to claim what's right and what's fair. And it's built into us. It's built into the whole structure of the universe. So when we say, why me, what we're really saying is, what happened to me is not fair. I didn't deserve it. And uh, fair enough. I mean, in one sense, that's true. Much much of the bad that happens to us is, is uh, not due to, say, consequences to our bad decision-making. Sometimes it is, but often it's because of a drunk driver or uh, another irresponsible person, someone who... Uh, does something, or the natural world that does something to us, you know. So we can do that. The, the problem, it seems to me, is twofold, and this is what I really pondered a lot. The first one is that I'm so informed by my kind of white, middle-class, Western perspective, where we really can, most of the time, control our lives in a way that makes them good. Mm -hmm. And gosh, a lot of people in the world never have that option. And I began to think, what makes me different from somebody uh, who lives in the Sudan or a child born in Pakistan or something like that? And I was, um, I was troubled a little bit by, by the kind of privileged place in society that I was claiming in that question, why me? Um, the other thing I began to think about is, why not me? I don't know why. I had this sort of reversal of, of uh, thinking, why not me? And it occurred to me, why should I live such a privileged life that other people don't have access to? And here's the conclusion I came to, and I'll tell you, this was really significant for me, folks. I, I can't tell you how much of a pivot point this was for my whole life. Is I realized that if I claimed a completely fair life, I'm not sure it would be any better. I didn't deserve my wife in the first place. She was superior to me in many ways. <laughs> Uh, certainly more mature than me when we married. <laughs> and I didn't deserve my daughter, Dinah Jane. I didn't deserve my mother, who was just a genuinely saintly woman. And there are lots of other things I've enjoyed in life that I don't deserve. So if I claim uh, a world that's entirely fair, I'm not sure I'd come out on the wing end. The other thing is I thought, grace isn't fair. And I want a world in which there's grace. Right. So overall, I guess I came to the conclusion I'd rather live in an unfair world where grace is available than live in a fair world where there's no grace at all. We, and, you uh, know, in these last 19 years, it's, been, it's going on 20 years now since the accident occurred, uh, would I reverse what happened 19 years ago? Absolutely. Absolutely I would. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the event continues to be bad in spite of all the good that's come out of it. It's, it's a standalone kind of thing. But I'll tell you, my life has been so rich and so beautiful on so many levels. I mean, my daughter's wedding is a kind of symbol of so much goodness that has enveloped my life. So I don't, I just, it, the idea of wanting to live in a completely fair and just world doesn't square with me as much as it used to, say, 20 or 25 years ago. Hmm. I mean, you wrote this beautiful quote. It says, who knows how one experience can so singular so singularly horrible can set into motion a chain of events that only that will bless future generations um that's what you were describing earlier is this horrible circumstance born out of this have been many blessings and many things that will bless many future generations um including this book which i believe has the power to really change lives um you speak of god's sovereignty and how you wrestled with that after you're losing your mother, your wife, and your daughter in one accident. And you talk about that issue, and so many people say, where was God when this happened? Where was oh, he? Yeah. And you you wrestle with it, and then you conclude that you have to, he has to be part of your life. But I, maybe you could just share a little bit about that process that you went through. I'm sure it took a number of years even to go through that. But yeah. Well, I, I mean, this is going to sound kind of strange, and maybe to some of your listeners even 
uh, slightly questionable. But I, I spent some time, uh, what I would call suspending faith. I never really had a huge religious crisis where I walked away from God, but I was so bewildered. I mean, bewildered in a kind of deep, grief-stricken way, and and confused. I, I just didn't understand how something like this could happen. I mean, I, of course, it happened, you know, millions of times through the history of the world, but uh, it happened to me, and that obviously changes your frame of reference. So I suspended faith for a while, and I thought about what the world would look like if there were no God at all. I mean, when we raise questions about God and say, how could you do this to me? Uh, this must prove that you don't exist. Then let's have God not exist and try that on for a while and, and ponder what life would look like if we had no God present at all. And two things came to me that were, again, very significant for my own kind of spiritual life and spiritual journey. Uh, the first one is that we need God even to make sense out of these experiences. I mean, why, for example, did I grieve so much? Why did I think that this thing was so singularly horrible and wrong? It requires some kind of overarching moral perspective, moral frame of reference. And take God out of the picture, it all becomes relative. <laughs> and uh, so that's the one, first thing I came to, is we probably need God more than we think we do. Or to put it uh, kind of paradoxically, we need God in order to blame God. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Yeah, without and him, secondly, who do we go to? Yeah, Yeah, that's right. And the second thing is, the answer to this kind of horrible suffering in the Christian faith is suffering. God's suffering in Christ. And there's no religion in my mind in the world that portrays a God who loves humanity so much that this God is willing to take on human suffering himself. Enter into the world, <clears throat> live a life of lowliness, and ultimately suffer in a way that none of us will be able to comprehend. And that 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 suffering God uh, in the garden and on the cross uh, became uh, very, very meaningful to me at the, at the deepest, at a, at a visceral level, and not just at an intellectual level. I remember just thinking about being in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus and what it must have been like for him to experience that agony, knowing what was awaiting him. And I thought to myself, from a Christian point of view, that's God suffering. That's God sweating. That's God asking this, this cup would be removed from him. That's God who submits himself to the divine will and says, not my will, but thine be done. See, I mean, this is, this is not some kind of sovereign God who's uh, inaccessible and transcendent and holy and unapproachable. God is that, but God is also the one who is in the garden praying and sweating and uh, anticipating with horror his own death. Jerry, as I read the chapter on that subject, the, the, the words, I, I had a pencil with me every time I read this book, and I wrote the words beautifully expressed, and you did it just again. That was, that was very beautiful, and it is the summary of why we believe and why we are called to um, endure these losses and hopefully uh, through them grow. And I, we are so thankful for your time today and for that you were um, able to join us. And, and uh, people you know, who are interested can Google Jerry Sitzer. That's uh, S-I-T-T-S-E-R. Um, all of his books are available, I believe, still available on Amazon.com. And we heartily recommend uh, Gina and I in our uh Uh, work with the New Day Foundation for Families. We uh, we hand these out to our families. We buy them by the box full, um, and they are well worth the read. And we are so privileged to have had this time together with you. Uh, thanks, my my privilege too. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank thanks you, so much. Jerry. Have a great day. You too. Bye, Bye now. Bye.